just before uh, getting into the whole issue of the perennial significance of the scholastic tradition in philosophy, I think it's probably best to begin with an indication of what I take to be the scholastic tradition. Uh, so what that tradition actually is, and from there, point out what I take to be significant about it. Like any philosophical tradition, it's quite difficult to draw boundary lines as to when it began and when it ended, and that's just the same for any philosophical tradition. But it is possible to advert to the high points of that tradition, as well as the low points, but hopefully we'll stick with the high points here. Uh, so we can advert to the high points of the scholastic tradition, and from that, infer the conditions that made such high points possible. So if we can advert to the high points of that scholastic tradition, then we can kind of have a look at what was it that made those high points possible, and from that point out uh, what is significant about the scholastic tradition. And the same can be said for the analytic tradition, still in its infancy, and the continental tradition, a lot older than the analytic tradition. Um, the climax of the scholastic tradition is undoubtedly the 13th and 14th centuries, so from 1200 to 1300s thereabouts. Uh, in which there rose to prominence not only the major thinkers associated with this tradition, so St. Bonaventure, St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, Blessed John Don Scotus, and William Vaughan. Uh, so five major think thinkers associated with that tradition, all in the space of about 200 years. Uh, but also other thinkers who helped to contribute to the philosophical climate within which these thinkers were able to emerge. So uh, a major philosopher doesn't just emerge out of a void, not like an angel come down from heaven and fix everything and just leave. Although, I suppose that could be said about Wittgenstein, he just came out of nowhere. A, a thinker usually comes from within a tradition and what wouldn't be able to do what he or she did without the philosophers that came before him. So look at Kant. Kant would have, wouldn't have been able to achieve what he achieved if it hadn't been for Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, Hume, and so forth. So there were thinkers who preceded these five major scholastics and then there were thinkers who came after them who ruined everything for everyone. Um, but I want to have a look at what were the conditions that made it possible for these five thinkers uh, to emerge. Now, in the 13th century, uh, well, these thinkers couldn't have emerged if it hadn't been for this peculiar invention of the Middle Ages known as the university. So the university was an invention of the Middle Ages. It was invented at the end of the 12th century. And in the 13th century, the European universities were in their infancy. Uh, but the idea of the university was already in its place, and it's an idea that's remained with the university right through to now, to the university that you guys are in at the minute. The university was to be a place of learning, independent of the state, whose students were subject not to the monarch of the state, but to the chancellor of the university. In that respect, the university transcended national boundaries insofar as students could come from anywhere to study in it. So the idea was that when you joined the university, it was like you were joining the state within a state. You weren't subject to the monarch or to the government or to the ruling authority. You were subject to the powers of the university. So you were exempt from taxation. You were exempt from con conscription into the army. You could get a special student visa, which meant you could live in that country without being uh, deported by the state. And some of those still apply today, so students can get student visas now to go to the university. It used to be when you were at university, you weren't subject to any sort of taxation. You could work, but you weren't subject to tax. At least when I was at university, I wasn't subject to any sort of tax at all. It's not the same now, isn't it? Really? You still have to pay tax. I think it's only council tax. You don't have to pay. Right. If you have a job, you have to pay tax. So right. Okay. Well, slowly being eroded away then. In any case, that was the idea of the university. So anybody from anywhere could come and be educated at the university and they weren't subject to the state, but just to the chancellor of the university. So this transnational aspect of the medieval university entailed that the mode of teaching at the university took on a special attitude. Um, at a university, one couldn't depend on tradition or authority in one's teaching, since given that you had students coming from everywhere else in the student body, it was not guaranteed that all the students would be aware or accept the same traditional authority that one would be appealing to. So that entailed then the teaching in the medieval university had to be quite systematic and not depend on any assumptions, really. Everything had to be analysed right down to the very basics, which, for want of a better word, any rational person would have to accept if they were rational. That was the idea behind it. So tradition went out the window then because of this transnational aspect of the medieval university. Um, so it was a problems-based mode of teaching whereby one got a problem uh, in a particular area. That problem is pre presented. As many positions for and against that problem are entertained and eventually a solution is provided to the problem. So this, led, this then influenced the mode of philosophizing in the medieval university uh, and the mode of philosophizing in the me medieval university was a disputed question. So if any of you have ever read medieval philosophy, the way in which medieval philosophers taught would have been, they would have come in 
and they would have been, say, they were maybe doing metaphysics or something, they would have taken a particular area of metaphysics, a particular set of problems in that area, and taken each problem in itself, considered a number of theses for and against the problem, and then considered a solution to the problem. And that way, one became acquainted with every position for and against the problem, and with a sort of synthetic position that tried to grant what was right in, any, in every position surrounding it. So it was quite, quite a systematic way of doing philosophy at the university. Um, I think this is one condition that allowed these five major scholastics to emerge because of the cultural climate in the university. One had to be uh, knowledgeable in every area of philosophy that one wanted to study if one was going to kind of pronounce on a particular area. So one couldn't just churn out articles here, there and everywhere without reading everything around that particular area. And so that's what these people were taught to do. And so that affected the way in which they philosophized. Now there was another condition which allowed for the emergence of these uh, scholastic thinkers, which I'll just invert to in a second. Out of the five thinkers I mentioned, four of them are saints, one of them isn't. Um, three of them are Franciscans and two of them are Dominicans. In the 13th century, there emerged two very peculiar religious orders. The first is the Order of Friars Minor, commonly known as the Franciscans. The second is the Order of Preachers, commonly known as the Dominicans. Uh, neither religious order was a settled order, so it didn't say in any one place. Its members uh, kind of went out by themselves, like we active service units, and just preached the gospel. That's what their job was. With the Dominicans in particular, there was an emphasis on study. So being a Dominican, study is one of the pillars of Dominican spirituality. If you don't do it, you're not being a good Dominican. Uh, and so they were attracted to these medieval universities. After a while, the student members of these religious orders became the professors at these universities, and eventually most medieval universities had Dominican and Franciscan chairs at the universities, and still do, scattered across Europe, Freeburg, for instance. The significance of this, uh, what I think, is that these religious orders realised that in order to realise their religious vocation, um, they had to go to people of a different cultural context, different educational background, and a different language. And they had to find a kind of an even plane on which they could communicate. Now, since the medieval university already aimed at a kind of a transnational education where anybody could come along and become educated, they saw in the medieval university an ideal mode of life suited to their religious way of life that they had chosen. So they all converged then on these different centres of learning. And one interesting thing, one interesting historical fact is when these um, religious orders converged, the teaching, the teachers at the universities tended to be the secular clerics, so uh, priests who were not part of religious orders, the secular clerics. Whenever the religious clerics came, the secular clerics went on strike. So at the University of Paris, they all went on strike. There was nobody to teach philosophy, so the Franciscans and the Dominicans didn't go on strike and they stayed. When the secular clerics tried to come back, their positions were all gone and taken up then by these religious orders. And because these religious orders didn't draw a salary, they weren't paid because they were begging orders, they only needed somewhere to live and a library. The university authorities kept them on, and so all these religious orders did at the time was simply live and study, say, you, but for about 18 hours a day it would have been at the university and teach and contribute to the university system. And so it meant then that philosophy in the medieval university was a way of life. It was coupled with a way of life and then subsumed into a religious way of life. So one didn't just come in and just do philosophy and write articles to get a job and draw a salary. One did philosophy because one thought one was achieving something, one was actually getting at the heart of a particular matter. So there was a kind of a zeal for doing philosophy and it was, it was taken very seriously. Uh, so that these uh, thinkers really were guarded against um, saying something that was false or saying something that was wrong because they thought they were actually trying to propagate the truth. Whether it were, they were or not is a different question, but at least that was the, uh, the motivational factor. So what marked then no studying philosophy at the medieval university was a desire to deal with a philosophical problem without appealing to tradition or authority as the determining factor, but in terms of the problem itself. Thus philosophers emanating from this medieval university took a very piecemeal approach, whereby a subject area is broken down into themes, these are broken down into problems, and then these are independently resolved. So the nature of medieval philosophy in the 13th century was quite systematic. Now the scholastic tradition in philosophy is what emerges out of this historical context. And its major philosophers all benefited from the sort of education involved in the medieval university and then mandated by the religious orders. The hard-headed systematic approach to philosophy, the refusal to depend on tradition or authority, and the desire to pre present philosophical conclusions in a way to transcend cultural boundaries are significant features 
of the scholastic philosophical tradition. But these are features that one would expect of any significant philosophical tradition. So if a tradition is to be philosophically significant, it should have these features to it. Um, so that's not going to be what I'm going to focus on with regard to the significance of the scholastic tradition, because I think the analytic and the continental traditions and our major thinkers have those features as well. What I think marks off the scholastic tradition as significant and the tradition worth studying is that its major thinkers present positions not, radically, not, not rad readily characterized in terms of the philosophers of the past, i.e. in terms of the thought that preceded them, and difficult to include in, the, in contemporary systems of philosophy, systems of philosophy that su su succeeded them. So they transcended the thinking of their predecessors and they anticipated the thinking of their successors. That means their thoughts can't fall within the boundaries of their predecessors or their successors, and thus it's worth studying it in itself. So if one were just to study the scholastic predecessors or the scholastic su successors and not the scholastics, one would be missing out an important chunk in the history of philosophy. Uh, that's what I, th I think is significant about the scholastics. In order to highlight this, I'm going to take one philosopher from this tradition, Aquinas, and explore how he superseded the possessions of his predecessors and anticipates the possessions of his successors. And so in what follows, I'm going to explore his thought in regard to the one and the many, so that's metaphysics, epistemology, his views in epistemology about the relation of mind to world and in the philosophy of mind. So I'm going to explore his thought in these three areas and then hopefully establish how he transcended the thought of his predecessors, notably the ancient Greek philosophers, and then anticipated the thought of Descartes, Locke, Hume, Kant, and more contemporary 20th century philosophers. So that's how good. So the one and the many, this is a problem in metaphysics, so we'll just put that up the one and the many. This is a problem with metaphysics. It's arguably the problem with metaphysics because whenever this problem emerged in the history of philosophy, it took an entirely new philosophical discipline to attempt to deal with this. And the problem is basically this. It emerges in pre-Socratic thought in the standoff between Heraclitus and Parmenides. So Heraclitus thinks, and he's trying to consider what the nature of reality is. And in accord with this sort of school he was working with at the time, it was an Ionian school, uh, so it was a radically materialist school, Heraclitus held that the really real, what's really real, is flux or change. So that unity, stability, is just an illusion, but what's really real is flux. So there's no unity, no identity to anything. There's just flux and constant change. And so the kind of catchphrase for the Heraclitian position is that you can't step in the same river twice. So you can't even think of the river because it's always flowing. So reality is always like that. Reality is always flowing. And just like whenever you look at a river, you think it's the same river. You think it's the one river. It's not really. It's just water constantly flowing. That's what Heraclitus thought reality is like. So at heart, it's all flux and appearances. Two appearances, it's just unity. But the unity isn't real. It's really real. It's the flux. Parmenides, on the other hand, takes the polar opposite view. Parmenides thinks that reality is one or unified. And he thinks that because he holds this position that being is and non-being is not. So this is a principle. Being is and non-being is not. If being is and non-being is not, then being could never change. Because in order to have change, you have to have non-being. That changes the being. And then that can change the non-being again. But if being is and non-being is not, being could never be non-being in which case it could never change into being or change to non-being, so being just is and is not subject to change. So that's why Parmenides thinks that being is just one and unified and that flux is just an illusion and the really real is the one. So this is the problem of the one and the many. And this became quite an entrenched position and this was the beginning of Western metaphysical thought. So this became quite an entrenched position and so the followers of each school uh, the Heraclitians go, well, I'm going to stick with Heraclitus, and the Parmenideans go, well, I'm sticking with Parmenides, and they just dug their heels in, and it became a sandbank. And so there was no progress in this uh, problematic until certain thinkers came along and says, look, let's side with neither, but let's include both, and find a position which is flexible enough to include both. And the first thinker, the first recorded thinker to, to, to include both was Plato. Now, Plato um, was a student of Cratylus, and Cratylus was a student of Heraclitus. So uh, Heraclitus says you can't step in the same river one, uh, uh, twice, 
Cradilus says you can't step in the same river once. Cradilus got so disaffected by any idea that reality could have any unity or identity to it that he stopped speaking. <laughs> he just stopped speaking. <laughs> because he didn't think reality was stable enough to be described in stable terms, so he just stopped speaking entirely. Uh, obviously he stopped speaking before he passed on his knowledge to Plato. Uh, so Plato was influenced by this Heraclitian doctrine, but at the same time, who was Plato's you know, biggest influence? He's in the Bill and Ted film. Socrates. Socrates, yeah. Socrates is Plato's biggest... Oh, Socrates. Yeah. <laughs> Socrates was Plato's biggest influence. And Socrates, what he did, he went around Athens, and he's going to all these people. He's going to like judges and lawmen and saying, look, what is justice? And the judge is all like, well, I just condemned this man to death. That's justice. And Socrates is like, no, that's an example of justice. Tell me what justice is. And the judge is like, oh, I don't know. Uh, he goes to the general and he says, what's well, courage? And the general says, oh, look, it's charge in the battlefield here. My soldiers, they're courageous. Do what they do. That's courage. And he says, no, no, that's an example of courage. Tell me what courage is. And they're like, I don't know. He did this so much to so many people that they executed him for it. Um, so that's what happened to Socrates. Uh, the point that Socrates was looking at, he was trying to look at the definition, the essence, the quiddity of what he was asking for. He's saying, what is X? So he's looking for something stable. So that introduces a Parmenidean influence on Plato. So he's got the Heraclitian influence through Cradilus, the flux, and he's got the Parmenidean influence, the stability, through Socrates. So he's trying to unify the two of them. And the way that he does so is through his theory of ideas. Um, not to dwell on the theory of ideas in too much depth, but Plato essentially holds that what reality is, it's on a scale of unity and flux, and he's got this famous myth of the divided line. So imagine a line uh, divided in two, and then each half is divided in two again. What you have at the very top of this line is the form of the good, and the form of the good, like the sun, illuminates everything below it, and below that are the forms of particular objects in reality, and those particular objects in reality cast shadows. So, shadows have the least, representations of objects like shadows or sculptures or whatever, they have the least sort of reality to them. So art is considered to have the same amount of value as a shadow. Okay, that's why Plato doesn't like art at all. Uh, these <coughs> objects, the objects that we see, have a little bit more reality to them, more reality than shadows, but less reality than the forms. So objects are related to the forms and the way shadows are related to the objects, and then the forms are related to the good and the way objects are related to the forms. Okay? And so what it is, you have an ascending scale of unity and a descending scale of flux. The f further down you go, the more dispersed and the more flux and the more change that you get, the further up you go, the more unified you get until you get to the form of the good, which is unity itself. And then in the Neoplatonists and Plotinus in particular, the good is the one from which everything emanates. That's the position of Plato. So what it is then, if you've got a load of particular, let's say particular humans, we'll put H here for a load of particular humans, they're all united, they're all human, so there's a oneness to them insofar as they participate in the form of human. They imitate that form of human in themselves. They're diverse and they imitate it quite imperfectly and there's different gradations in the way in which they imitate this one form of human. That's the way Plato thinks reality is constituted. And so, Parmenides with his one is um, kind of acknowledged up here, but Heraclitus with his flux is acknowledged here. Okay, That's a significant advance in the problematic beyond Heraclitus and Parmenides because now Plato was able to draw the support of followers of both schools. Now, does anybody know Plato's most famous student? Sure you do. How do you know, don't you? I'm not speaking on YouTube. No, I'm not speaking on YouTube. <laughs> His most famous student was Aristotle. Um, Aristotle was Plato's most famous student. He studied with Plato for about 19 years at the Academy, at Plato's school called the Academy. Um, and then whenever Plato died, the kind of uh, the head of the school didn't go to Aristotle, I'm sure. It went to uh, Plato's nephew, Theosophus. Didn't go to Aristotle because Aristotle was in Greek, he was Macedonian. Um, so, uh, so the Athenians didn't want the grant it to a Macedonian, so Arsene wasn't made head of the school. So he goes off and he tutors Alexander the Great, and then he comes back and forms up his own school called the Lyceum. And so it's quite interesting where there's a major Aristotelian influence in a country. The word for their school 
is usually some derivative of a lyceum. So in French, the school is a lycée. Uh, whereas if there's a major platonic influence, a school is known as the academy, because Plato at the academy. Now for technical reasons, Aristotle rejects this theory of Plato's. Uh, one of the reasons is known as the third man argument. Basically, the form is introduced to account for what is common to all the individuals. But there has to be something common between the form and the individuals. So there has to be another form that accounts for what's common between this form and the individuals. This is known as the third man argument. Um, and so we need another form to unite everything here. But there has to be something common between this form, this form, and these individuals. And so we need another form. And so on and so on and so on. So rather than getting us any sort of unity, Aristotle says that the forms just stretch everything out to infinity, and that's not what Plato wants. Plato just multiplies flux. So Aristotle has a different tact on the matter. He still has his own theory of forms, which I'll explain to you in a second, but he diverges away from this platonic notion of participation. When Aristotle comes to deal with the problem of the one and the many, he's thinking, well, look, this is a problem about being and about how being could be both one and many. So let's think about how we use being intelligibly. What are our intelligible expressions of being? And he says, all predications of being are predications by analogy. So this is the analogy of being. And he says, when we consider how we predicate something analog analogously, think of health. When we ask what is healthy, we start listing things that are healthy. So we say exercise, food, urine, being a sign of health, blood being a sign of health, and so forth. They're all healthy. But in themselves, they're not healthy. You just take food. Food is just food. It's just matter. It's not healthy in itself. Urine is the same. Blood is the same. They're only healthy insofar as they're related to some subject. So the exercise contributes to the health of the subject. Food is the same. Urine is a sign. Blood is a sign of health, and so forth. So the exercise, say for one subject, me, that it would take to make me healthy, would not be the same sort of exercise that my 90 year old father in law would have to take. Okay, so it's proportionate to the particular subject in question, and that's analogical or predication or predication by proportion. Now, Aristotle holds that this is how we predicate being. So, if we're going to predicate being analogously, we need a primary analogate, just like in health, we need something which is primary, and secondary analogates which get their signification from the primary analogate. So these are secondary. Okay. So we need a primary and secondary signification of being. Aristotle says that the primary and secondary significations of being are substance and accident. So anything that in any way exists is either a substance, a substance or an accident of some substance. Okay, so substances are basic particulars, and they have accidents. So I'm a substance, and I have certain accidents. I'm a certain height, a certain weight, a certain color, and so forth. I can still be the substance I am, and those accidents can change. I can change in weight and height. I can lose an arm or a leg and still be a human. That's the idea behind Aristotle's division. And so, given that substance is the primary signification of being, if the one and the many is going to be resolved, it's going to be in terms of substance, because that's what primarily signifies being. So. Aristotle's definition of substance is that it is what is what is said neither of nor in a thing. That's what substance is. It's what's said neither of nor in a thing. So it's a basic particular predicated neither of or in anything that things are predicated of and in it. In order to be such, Aristotle holds, a substance has to be a this, such, and such an individual of a kind, the such and such men indicate its kind, so this dog, this cat, this human, this tree. Now this signifies individuality, and the such and such signifies its kind too. And that's the, that's the one and the many there. So the unity, the stability is the kind, and the manyness is the individuality, you can have many individuals. So if Aristotle can show how a substance can be a this and a such and such, i.e. an individual of a kind, he'll have offered a solution to the one and the many, which unifies both our class and Parmenides. Aristotle thinks he can do that by saying that this, the individuality of the thing, is accounted for by its matter, and the kind is accounted for by its form. The example that he always uses of this is a bronze statue. 
The bronze out of which the statue is made is its matter. The shape of the statue is its form. The same shape of the statue could be replicated in many different chunks of matter, but it's the different chunks of matter which individuate the form, allowing for there to be many individuals of that same form. So you could have, say, the statue of David. You go to Rome and you see all these statues of David there, and they're all realised in different chunks of marble. Or, well, not marble, it's too expensive, whatever they're made of. Um, different chunks of stuff occupying different spatial dimensions from the other one. But the form is all the same. The shape is all the same for each of them, uh, unless it's a pretty poor... Uh, replication of the same statue. But the idea there is that things have forms and that the form is unified with matter so that what a substance is is a matter form composite. So it's a composition of matter and form. So if that makes sense then, Aristotle has arguably solved the problem of the one and the many by uniting Heraclitus and Parmenides, but in a non-Platonic way. So his view, his view of the forms here isn't the idea that objects participate in some forms, but objects have forms and are formed in a certain way. Now one other particular about Aristotle's position here is that matter stands in potency to form, and form actualizes the potency of matter. So matter, a, a block of matter could be anything. You could carve it into a statue of David or anything else. But it's the particular form which actualizes it into this particular type of statue that it is. So form actualizes matter, and matter stands in potency to form. So that's the composition of the material substance from Aristotle. So there you have Plato trying to unify Heraclitus and Parmenides with his view. And here you have Aristotle trying to unify Heraclitus and Parmenides with his view. Now, their positions, whether right or wrong, offer a significant advance in the problematic but in offering an advance in the problematic setup, an alert disjunction, the disjunction between Plato and Aristotle. And so we will get another significant advance in the problem if we can find a position which unifies Plato and Aristotle and finds a way of putting Plato and Aristotle together again. That was the task of the Neoplatonists. The Neoplatonists tried to unify Plato and Aristotle. And insightful and enlightening as the Neoplatonists were, there was a fundamental flaw about Neoplatonism, what would I think? is a flaw about Neoplatonism insofar as they think they can resolve this standoff between Plato and Aristotle by trying to turn Aristotle into a Platonist and saying that really what Aristotle is saying is accommodated for within the terms of Platonism. So it's not so it's a Neoplatonism, it's really just Platonism trying to be wide enough to include Aristotle. I don't think that's very fair in Aristotle because I think Aristotle had significant disagreements with Plato. So if there can be a new position, an independent position, that neither Plato nor Aristotle would have recognised, but yet can still accommodate their positions, then that will represent a significant advance in this metaphysical discussion. And so I'm, suggest, I'm going to suggest now that the position of Aquinas in this regard unifies uh, the positions of Plato and Aristotle and can account for um, the, the main lines of thought in their positions, but at the same time is a position that neither Plato nor Aristotle would have been happy with. Okay, So I'll move on to Aquinas' position. So, with regard to the forms, Aquinas is not a Platonist at all. He doesn't think that um, individual objects participate in some sort of transcendental forms by which they are formed. So he says with Aristotle with regard to forms, and he thinks that concrete objects are composites of matter and form. So concrete material objects are composites of matter and form, that's what a subset of material substance is, so he's quite happy to go with Aristotle on that. But for Aquinas, he, Aquinas holds that the, the matter form composite of the thing, that simply signifies the thing's essence. I, what the thing is, that's all that does, that's all that that signifies. But there's something missing in this formula here for concrete objects, because there are a lot of matter form composites which used to exist but which no longer exist, Aristotle and Socrates being one of them, or being two of them, um, and they're uh, matter form composites which could exist, maybe, but don't exist, such as Pegasus, for instance, or Phoenix, or whatever. Uh, so you can have non-existing things which are matter form composites, as well as things that did exist which are matter form composites, as well as things which currently do exist which are matter form composites. So being a matter form composite, i.e. being a thing with an essence, 
really is neutral with regard to existence and non-existence. So there is another metaphysical category here that needs to be applied, and that's the category of existence. And this is what Thomas brings to the metaphysical discussion. Now, Thomas holds that essence and existence are really distinct. They're not separate. It's not like Cartesian dualism, you know, separation of mind and body. Uh, they're really distinct insofar as essence is not existence and existence is not essence. Um, but essence and existence are composed in things which currently exist. They were composed in things that used to exist, and they could be composed in things that could exist. Um, Thomas has very technical uh, argumentation as to why they're really distinct. I'll not go through this through it now, okay? It would take too long. If you want to talk about it afterwards, we can talk about it afterwards. But essentially his view is that essence is distinct from existence, and existence is distinct from essence. Given that this is how he thinks the nature of experimental reality is, he's going to try and solve the one and the many in terms of essence and existence. Now, it's already been stated that he agrees with Aristotle with regard to matter-form composition. So he thinks essence can be both one and many in terms of matter and form, so that a thing is an individual because of its matter, and it's in common with other individuals because of its form. So, so he accepts Aristotle's solution of the one and the many here with regard to essence, but when it comes to existence, he diverges from Aristotle because Aquinas holds that essence stands in potency to existence, and existence actualizes essence. So existence is the act of essence, and essence stands in potency to existence. What that entails for Thomas, then, is that essence participates in its own individual act of existence for as long as it exists. So an essence is an individual because it's uh, made up of matter and form, and that individual essence then participates in its own act of existence. So existence is limited and individuated to the essence whose act it is. So my act of existence isn't, say, my daughter's. My daughter's act of existence received her act of existence as soon as she came into existence, and I was already in existence before she received it. When I go out of existence, hopefully she won't go out of existence. Um, so existence is individual to each individual entity that possesses it. So existence is individuated to the essence whose existence it is, but in itself, it's common to all things that have existence. Just consider itself, existence is common. Everything can, that exists has existence. And so existence unites all things which are essence, all essences that exist, but yet is individuated to the essence that exists. So, in holding then that um, essence and existence are related as potency and act, so this circle here, this is Aristotle, this composition of act and potency, but in holding that in being a composite of potency and act, the potency principle essence participates in the act principle existence. He's honoring Plato. So he's drawing on the Platonic and Aristotelian solutions to the one and the many that neither Plato nor Aristotle would have been happy with because neither of them were neither of them adverted to a notion of existence as a distinct metaphysical principle of things. And so neither of them, uh, at least in the writings, would have been happy with this. It would be different if you dug them up and asked them what they thought. Um, hopefully they listen to right reason. Um, so given then that uh, his thought takes in what they have said, advances the problematic beyond what they've said, and is a position that neither of them would uh, really have given much support to, Thomas's position represents a, a new position to take seriously in philosophy, which transcends the uh, philosophical problematic bequeathed to him by his successors, at least in this respect. And I think that's significant for the scholastic philosophical tradition. Okay, so that's the metaphysics side of things. All right, just can ask me questions about it afterwards. Um, can I go on to the epistemology side of things? All right, yeah, great. So, my apologies for those who sat in on my scholastic metaphysics and got bombarded with that for, what was it, three hours one week? <laughs> Yeah, three hours of nothing but that. That's not to scare off any second here, students who are thinking of doing it, by the way, all right? So, I'll go on to Aquinas' Epistemology and Philosophy of Mind, which I don't teach. So, um, so this will be all new to you, Patrick, won't it? Absolutely brand new. So, Aquinas and his contemporaries, they took metaphysics to be what was called first philosophy. So... So metaphysics was first philosophy, and the reason why they took it to be first philosophy is because it simply uh, studied being. 
So that's what metaphysics study. They just study being as being. Um, they held that other sciences study, say, different levels of being. So say if being is like a cake, metaphysics just studies the entire cake. Um, say physics studies, I don't know, the ice and layer. Um, you know, chemistry studies the cream layer. You know, biology studies the jam layer, that sort of thing. Um, they took it to be that other sciences just took a slice of being and studied that, whereas metaphysics studied being as being. That then entailed that metaphysics was first philosophy, because in studying being, it studied that which every other science presupposes. Every other science presupposes its being and studies a chunk of it. Metaphysics studies all of it. Uh, so it grants the intelligibility of all other sciences. After metaphysics, then you had epistemology. And this studied being as no one. Then after epistemology, you have moral philosophy. And this study being as acted upon. So metaphysics studies being, then epistemology studies being, that has been studied in metaphysics as it's knowable, and then moral philosophy studies being as acted upon, which can't be done unless being is known uh, in and of itself. So moral philosophy comes third, doesn't mean it's any lesser. In fact, um, Aristotle and Aquinas held you couldn't study moral philosophy until you were about 50 or 60 years old because you didn't have enough life experience to do it. So uh, there was a pedagogical kind of hierarchy where you started with mathematics and moved your way right up. Uh, and then moral philosophy came last in the pedagogy. And then logic is kind of normative for all of this. So this was philosophy for the medievals. And then after that, you kind of had philosophy of science, philosophy of religion, philosophy of society, philosophy of politics, that sort of thing. But without this, you couldn't do any of the philosophy of disciplines. This constituted what philosophy was. When we get to modern philosophy, metaphysics ceases to be first philosophy for a number of historical and philosophical reasons. I think William of Ockham um, is really an important catalyst in the turn to modern philosophy. And then Ockham's influence, especially in England, um, with the British empiricists, and then also in France as well, led to uh, the likes of Descartes and Locke and Hume and the positions that they adopted. But really what happens when modern philosophy comes along is that metaphysics is no longer first, but epistemology becomes first. So what we have then is epistemology as first philosophy. Uh, and then, so once we know that we can know being, then we can study being. So metaphysics comes after that. So first of all, we have to study how it is that we can know being, and then we have to study the being that can be known. And that's brought this pinnacle in Kant. Kant who says, we need to look at the conditions for the possibility of knowledge. And once we do that, then we look at the knowledge that that gives us. And that's when we do metaphysics. So that inverts the procedure of the medievals. So, as such, modern philosophy focuses really on the life of the mind and attempts to consider how one can get from a mental space to the real world. So what modern philosophy does is set up this juxtaposition between mind and world. So you have the mind, this is the mental space, and mentality. And within that mental space, you have spontaneity. You can think as you'd like in that mental space. You're free to get things right, to get things wrong, to think whatever. And that's where concepts are. And that's juxtaposed then from the world. You have the world. And that's the world of facts. So the problem then in modern philosophy, once you start focusing on the life of the mind and consider the mind in and of itself, you separate it from the world. The whole problem then is how do you get back to the world? That's where the problems come in. And then this is brought up very brilliantly in Descartes. You know, after he just doubts everything that could be doubted, the only thing he can't doubt though, is that he has a mind or that he is a mind. And then he has to try and build back all the representations in this mind to the world. And that's what modern philosophy is all about. It's looking for some type of external constraint on the mind which will weigh down the, the concepts in the mind and connect them up with the world. And that's what Descartes does, that's what Locke does, that's what Hume does to a certain degree. They lock themselves up within this private mental space and ask, what is the extra mental constraint on thought which will guarantee the objectivity of thought? Kant comes along, thank God, and saves the day. Kant comes along and says, look, all you guys, you're sort of looking for some sort of extra mental constraint on thought which justifies our thought about the world and holds that our concepts are in accord with the facts. Forget about that. Why can't the mind itself be the constraint? Why can't the mind itself be the justification for its thought? In that case then, 
It's not so that mind is coming into conformity with the world. The world has to come into conformity with the mind. So that the mind is structured in such a way that whenever the world comes into contact with it, we structure the actual world that we see. So our thought then, our thought processes are like coloured sunglasses which distort the picture in a certain way. So that all we have knowledge of is phenomena, not the really real or what Kant called the noumena. But notice what Kant is holding. He's denying that we have to build a bridge between mind and world and saying that in order for there to be knowledge, mind and world have to be conformed to each other in a certain way. There has to be conformity between the two, some type of identity between the two. Kant thinks that the world has to be conformed to the mind and not the mind to the world. The reason why I think Kant held that the world has to be conformed to the mind is because he's got implicit Cartesian assumptions here. The implicit Cartesian assumption is that there is this thing called a mind, that the mind is a real thing, which is spontaneous, it can think about the world in any way that it likes. So it couldn't be then that the mind has to come into conformity with the facts, because if it did, it would lose its essential spontaneity. It would lose that freedom to think about things as, as it liked. So we held then that the facts have to come into conformity with the mind in order to preserve that spontaneity. So that's a very Cartesian type of assumption that he has, that there is this thing called the mind exercising control over things. Reverse back a few hundred years. <coughs> Prior to Descartes, prior to Descartes invented the mind, Aquinas had no notion of this thing called the mind. There was no such thing as this private mental space in medieval philosophy. All there was was human individ individuals, living, breathing animals that simply engaged with the world around them. So there wasn't this space of mentality. There was just the world. And in this world wasn't the mind, but a living, breathing human being which engages with the world around it, not in some private, detached mental space, but simply something that a human can do in the way that a human can see, touch and feel, or in the way that a cow can eat grass. A human, on the basis of its bodily organs, can literally digest the nature of the world. So for Aquinas, there isn't this dualism of a space of concepts and a space of fact. The space wherein concepts abound is not in the head, but Concepts are in the world. The world is conceptual. When I experience the world, I experience it as something. So when I experience a table, I just don't experience colours, shapes and sizes. I experience it as a table. And that table is a table before I come to experience, even irrespective of I come to experience it. I then have conceptual capacities that allow me to recognise that table as a table. And so that means then that when I come to know the world, when I come to know it, my conceptual capacities come into conformity with the conceptual content in the world. So for Aquinas then, what there is, is there's conformity between intellect and world, whereas for Kant, there's conformity between world and intellect. So Aquinas has it that the intellect wraps itself around the conceptual content in the world, um, and Kant has it that the world wraps itself around the conceptual capacities of the intellect. So really Kant has inverted Aquinas' procedure. Never read him. I have no idea who he was, but he's just inverted Aquinas' procedure. But he only inverts it because of that Cartesian assumption that there is a mind. If we get rid of this notion that there is a mind, then we don't have to go down that Kantian route. And so my suggestion then is that Aquinas is epistemological thought that we have conceptual operations which can come into conformity with concept, uh, conceptual content in the world, is a position not only that anticipated uh, the Cartesian problematic and Kant's final solution to that, but is also one which can take a place in contemporary epistemology today, and, with, and is one which has independently been arrived at by the American philosopher John McDowell uh, in his presentation of a post-Kantian uh, epistemology. So McDowell never read Aquinas before. Well, when he articulated his thought in Mind and World, he had never read Aquinas, and then John Haldane, and everybody going, hold on a minute, that's, that's Aquinas, and then he went and read Aquinas, and he thought, yeah, so it is. Um, so, it's an independently defensible position in contemporary thought, which is taken up and defended by post-Kantian philosophers, and it's one that anticipated uh, Cartesian and Kantian developments in philosophy. So, I think that's another significant uh, mark for the scholastic tradition in philosophy, that it has anticipated future developments, and offers a position that can't be adopted in contemporary thought. The last issue then is the philosophy of mind. Um, 
In this respect, I want to focus on the really vexed issue of dualism. Because in contemporary philosophy of mind, dualism is quite a formulaic sort of problem that takes on, <coughs> when you read any introductions to the philosophy of mind or dis discussions of dualism, they always start with Descartes. And they always take Descartes to be you know, the methodological starting point. And you know, that kind of sets the scene. But if we go back to before Descartes, there's some interesting positions on the nature of mindedness and what it is to have a mental life that doesn't sit quite easily in the contemporary discussion. And I'm going to get on to that now. Um, so in general, contemporary dualisms, they fall into two sorts. You have what's called substance dualism and property dualism. So substance dualism, it's a very common view uh, that um, a lot of, well, of non-philosophers would tend to be committed to this view. Substance dualism denies that the human being is essentially a material thing, um, whereas property dualism seeks to grant that man is, or that a human being is essentially material, whilst at the same time recognizing that pro mental properties are immaterial. Uh, so substance dualism holds the view that a human being is made up of two substances. Um, so you've got two substances, you've got a body and a mind. That's substance dualism. These are two separate or separable uh, substances, uh, and they interact with one another in some sort of way, some sort of way that, say, their, their defenders kind of depict Descartes or Leibniz or whoever. Uh, David Chalmers, he's familiar with David Chalmers? Rock star philosopher, long blonde hair, beard, he's brilliant. He's a kind of a substance dualist. Sorry? In consciousness. Yeah. Or from the consciousness. Yeah. Property dualism holds that there's only one substance, <coughs> the body, you know, that's what we are, we're material bodies. And that one substance has certain properties. And some of those properties are material. And some of those properties are immaterial. Now those immaterial properties emerge out of the material properties and supervene over the material properties. So they're not real. Okay, They just emerge from the material properties. In the same way that uh, color properties emerge from the relationship between the light, the object, and your eye. So these uh, dualistic properties are not real, thick sort of properties in the way the material properties are. They simply emerge from materiality and supervene over them. So they have a kind of phenomenological feel to them, but they're not really real. What's really real is the materiality of the body. Uh, so these are the two different types of dualisms in contemporary philosophy of mind. Now, Thomas argues that man is essentially a material thing. That's what Thomas argues. Man is essentially a material thing. And his position can grant that mental properties are immaterial. It can grant that if it wants to. Um, but they don't have to be. They don't have to be immaterial. So Thomas can adopt reductive physicalism, that there aren't even these immaterial properties on the position he adopts. But the position he adopts at least can allow for there to be immaterial properties. That's the position that he takes. Now, Thomas's account of what uh, the human being is takes in his view uh, of what is called the soul. Now, the notion of a soul in contemporary literature is almost always applied to substance dualism. So the idea of the soul here is simply this, the mind. And that's Descartes' fault. Descartes, um, well, if you read any histories of the philosophy of mind, it's actually Shakespeare's fault. He popularized it. But it was Descartes that really you know, equated the idea of the soul with the mind, this separate sort of substance. So after Descartes, everybody talking about a soul, unless there's Thomists, I don't know what they're talking about. They're, they're talking about this kind of separate substance, mental substance called the mind. Um, Thomas unequivocally denies that the soul is the mind. There was a position in ancient Greek thought attributable to Plato that held that the soul was like this pilot in a ship controlling the ship, or the charioteer in a chariot. Thomas explicitly says, no, that's wrong. That's absolutely false. And he's got technical reasons uh, for saying that's false. He thinks that that disrupts the unity of the human person. He thinks that the human person is a unit, and so can't be made up of these two separable sort of things. So he thinks that whenever I, whenever I move my arm, it's not that I've got this soul telling my body to move the arm. It's that I, the person, am moving the arm. So there's a unity there that he thinks is disrupted in this account. So if he rejects this account, then what does he think that the soul actually is? Um, well, he certainly doesn't think that it's this kind of mental separate substance sort of thing. He doesn't think that the soul is a substance at all. He defines a soul as that whereby a living thing is a living thing, so that by which a living thing lives. 
And it clarifies that a living thing is a living thing, not simply because it's a bodily thing, because there can be lots of bodily things which aren't alive. A table, for instance, is a bodily thing which isn't alive. So a living thing isn't a living thing because it's a bodily thing, but because of the type of bodily thing that it is. So certain types of bodies are alive, certain types of other bodies aren't alive. So given the type of bodily thing that one is, then one will be a living thing if one is of the type of bodily thing that is alive. But on the metaphysics that Thomas adopts, a bodily thing is the type of thing that it is because of its form, because of the form that it has. So this table has a certain form, which means that it's a table and so not a living thing, whereas a human has a form which entails that it is a living thing. Thus Thomas holds that insofar as the soul is that whereby a living thing is a living thing, the soul is the form of the body. So in the same way that the shape of the statue is the form of the statue, the soul is the form of the body for Thomas. Uh, the form of the body, whilst it's not identical with the body, in the same way as the shape of the statue isn't identical with the matter out of which it is made, uh, nevertheless is nothing separate from the body, in the way that Descartes and Busy use it here, in which case the soul isn't a separate substance from the body. Body and soul are united and they form a single substance which is the living bodily thing, in the same way that the shape of the statue and the matter of the statue, whilst distinct, are not separable, and they're united to form one single entity. That's the way Thomas thinks body and soul are related. Um, furthermore, the soul as the soul of the body is present throughout the body in forming it, in the same way that the shape of the statue is present throughout the statue, the soul is present throughout the body in forming it. So that it's not the case that when the body moves, the soul, like a pilot, moves the body. Rather, when the body moves, it's because it's an animate thing capable of self-motion, and so the motion of the body is the very motion of the soul. Thomas then is a dualist of sorts insofar as he distinguishes between the soul as form and the body that it informs. But he's neither a substance dualist nor a property dualist. He's, ne he's neither of these types of dualists. Um, since he explicitly denies in a number of places that the soul is a substance and he doesn't hold that mental properties are properties emerging from physical properties. Rather, mentality is located for Thomas in the type of thing that one is. One just is that type of thing with mental properties. Um, and the type of thing that the human being is, is a bodily thing, Thomas says. So one has mental properties because one is a certain type of body, in the same way that a cow is able to digest grass just because it's a certain type of animal. That's all Thomas is going to say on that. Um, it's the living bodily thing that thinks and wills and moves, not a bodily thing thinking and willing by means of certain immaterial properties. To be sure, there is a phenomenology associated with mental properties, so there's a certain state that one's in, there's a what it's like to be in a certain mental state. But for Thomas, this need not entail that those properties themselves are immaterial or irreducible to material properties, only that they are properties of a very peculiar sort, uh, which place um, the individual having them in a certain subjective state. But it's entirely reasonable, and um, Paul and Patricia Churchland would say the same, to assume that being put in such a subjective state is accountable for in terms of being the type of thing that one is, i.e. being a living bodily material thing. So Thomas is able to grant that a human being is essentially a material thing, whilst at the same time advocating a type of dualism of sorts which is neither a substance dualism nor a property dualism, but can yet grant some of the phenomenological considerations that will motivate, say, this type of contemporary dualism that we are put into a certain subjective state which we're not in just on the basis of material properties. So it can grant the intelligibility of talk like this, but it need not. It can still grant the sort of intelligibility of those more reductive accounts that denies that there are material properties. Um, given then that Thomas's position of philosophy of mind is capable of straddling different positions within the contemporary position, but isn't characterizable in any one of those positions, we then have a position which anticipates the contemporary discussion and presents a third option in the contemporary discussion capable of being taken over and above the other options. And already uh, you've got the, like, not only Thomists taking that position, such as John Haldian and Paul MacDonald, but also the likes of E.J. Lowe, Jonathan Lord Durham, taking a similar type of position, even though he's never, he doesn't specialise in Aquinas, nor does he agree with them. So what I've argued then, is that Thomas' positions in metaphysics, epistemology, and philosophy of mind all engage in original ways with their philosophical predecessors and they anticipate their successors uh, and so that they represent live options in contemporary thought. So I've presented Thomas here as a paradigmatic scholastic philosopher, primarily because he's the one I specialise in, formed by that philosophical milieu. I could have considered other thinkers, and Patrick still wakes up screaming in the night with the other thinkers that we did consider in scholastic metaphysics. 
we could have considered some of the other thinkers I mentioned, and they all offered innovative positions. So if you're unlucky enough to do my course, you know, you'll see Bonaventure get compared with uh, Heidegger, you'll see John Don Scotus get compared with uh, Saul Kripke, Hilary Putnam and so forth. Um, so John Don Scotus, he offers uh, a metaphysical position that anticipates Kripkean essentialism and possible worlds metaphysics, but Scotus was a Franciscan and I'm a Dominican, so I will not be giving him. Um, my point is that scholastic philosophical tradition, just like any other tradition, it can boast of thinkers who took problems in philosophy seriously uh, that other generations attempted to tackle, and the way that the scholastics tackled them was highly original and forward-looking, in which case I think they are worthy of contemporary study. In the same way that Descartes, Locke, Hume, and even Plato and Aristotle are worthy of a contemporary investigation. And so in that respect, I submit that there's a perennial significance to the scholastic philosophical tradition. Thank you. Thank you.